I was supposed to shoot this video two weeks ago but then I realized I was actually working on Christmas Eve and Christmas so I literally didn't have the time so here we are talking about the best movies of 2023 the first video of the year is gonna be quite a controversial one <laughs> Let's get nuts. No, God, please, no, no! Everyone has been posting their top 10, top 20, top 15 lists on Twitter, letterbox, it doesn't really matter. Everyone has their own favorites. Expectations define everything that you like when it comes to cinema. We all have different lists because we all have different tastes. And here I am giving you my own list, which is 100% subjective. If you want to have a look at something objective, then in a couple of months, I'm going to be releasing a video, which is going to be called the Fuck the Oscars, What? this instead I've been doing it for the last couple of years and there is way more objectivity in that one also I feel like there are so many films which get released towards the very 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 end of the year that it's almost impossible to catch them up as a random moviegoer which means that very often people still are watching movies from 2023 in January February and March just because they all come out in November and December and it's kind of insane I'm among those we have Godzilla minus one which was actually released for only one day here in France which is absolutely insane we also have zone of interest we have Priscilla Maestro poor things by Yorgos Lantimos which would probably end up being on my list at the end of the day because I love his work we've got also indie gems like Godland and Earth Mama and I also have a special mention for Napoleon this year which is gonna put in a different category called unrated because now we know that apparently there is a version that exists out there which is four hours long like a director's cut version which is gonna be premiering on Apple TV plus maybe in a couple of months so basically the film that we watch in the cinema is not the official edition at all I kind of hate this weird trend they're doing the same thing for Rebel Moon so Zack Snyder's new sci-fi epic so it means that you can't really give an objective opinion about Napoleon especially when the movie that we saw is literally missing one third of its length we're gonna go deep into our top 20 starting with a movie that baby you've not heard about at all because it's an indie sci-fi gem which is called if you were the last why the hell did we watch that movie this is everything that I love about science fiction. It's incredibly cute, but also it's very thought provoking, really strong performances, of course, but also a strong visual style. It's directed by Kristen Mercado Figueroa, and it's basically about two astronauts who are adrift in their broken down space shuttle with little hope of rescue and who argue over whether they better off spending the remaining days as friends or something more. So yes, of course, it is a bit of a romantic comedy. It kind of reminds you of that an incredibly creepy film with Jennifer Lawrence that came out a couple of years ago which was supposed to be romantic as well but it ended up just being very very creepy this time around it's just very cute it's just very thoughtful and it's one of those films that it's not gonna change your life but it's definitely gonna brighten up your evening especially if you watch it with your friends or your loved ones we're gonna stay in the indie realm for my number 19 which is gonna be are you there god it's me Margaret do you think any of us to look like that when we're 19. I love these kind of films which didn't really get to have that much space on our screens or even in Hollywood when I was well the age of the main character if you think about movies like 8th grade for example or even if you think about the R-rated Judd Apatow produced movie whose title I can't remember right now but I'm gonna put the poster right here basically Are You There God It's Me Margaret is about an 11 year old kid who navigates new friends feelings and the beginning of adolescence especially because because her family just moved from the city to the suburbs and it's directed by Kelly Freeman Craig. I think the most beautiful thing about this movie is that it, you can really feel that it's prioritizing women's perspective no matter what their age is. And it's something quite refreshing within our industry as well. It's not really like a religious movie, it's not really just a comedy or just a drama. It's a mix of all of those things together. One of those experiences that you never want to end. You just wanted to keep going forever just because you 
fallen in love with these characters so much. I'll go last. Let's go! I don't mind that. And with number 18, we're gonna be going into some blockbuster fun adventures because I'm talking about Dungeons and Dragons. I had zero expectations when it comes to this film. I have a review for it as well on my channel, which didn't do really well, but I don't really care because honestly, as a fantasy fan, I was sitting there being like, this is exactly everything that I wanted from this movie and also from the IP itself. It's directed by John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, and it's basically about a charming thief and a band of unlikely adventurers who undertake an epic heist to retrieve a lost relic, but things go dangerously awry when they run afoul of the wrong people. This is honestly one of the best fantasy movies I've seen in a really long time and in that video over there I was talking about the fact that the fantasy genre has kind of found a new fertile ground in the TV industry. If you look at House of the Dragon, if you look at Shadow and Bone and other things like that, we don't really get high budget fantasy movies in our cinemas anymore and especially those kind of films that are just really fun and then you don't have to take seriously. So not movies like Lord of the Rings basically or even the Hobbit movies. Every single time that I'm working on a top 20 list for all the movies that came out on a specific year, I'm always sitting there being like, do I remember this movie? Did this change my life in any kind of way? Did this make my life even a little tiny better? And when it comes to Dungeons and Dragons, I keep thinking about it all the time. Of course, it's not one of the best movies ever made. I'm not trying to say that, but it's without a doubt incredibly memorable and really, really, really fun. And honestly, this this year has been quite tough when it comes to the movie industry. It was hard to make a list like this and uh, this movie has been on it since the very beginning since it was released. For the number 17 we're gonna go back into the indie filmmaking world and talk about an incredibly weird once again sci-fi movie which is called Landscape with Invisible Hands. I want to grow up and fall in love and be swept off my feet. We've lost a lot since you guys came here. But we've overcome a lot too. There is this incredibly tiny portion of the sci-fi genre where we have an alien invasion and the alien invasion is not exactly the main subject of the movie but it's about the aftermath, it's about how people basically have to live with these new forms of life and how it changes everything. I can only think of another movie within this genre and it's District 9 so if you love District 9 you're gonna love this movie as well but of course it's not as serious, it's not as political but it's as as much fun and as weird without a doubt. After years into a benevolent alien occupation, mankind is still adjusting to its new overlords. When two teenagers discover that aliens are fascinated with human love and will pay for access to it, they decide to live stream their romance to make extra cash for their families. So of course we're talking about the TikTok generation, we're talking about constantly kind of like performing for someone else, but this time around it's humans performing for aliens, so the aliens don't really watch as much TV as us, they don't really understand human relationships as much as we do, meaning that certain things are gonna be perceived as fake to them, that they're not necessarily for us. So it's incredibly interesting when it comes to talking about performance ship, when it comes to putting on a different mask every single day of your life to the point that you don't really know who you are and you don't really know what defines you. It's a huge existential journey that is delivered with a very very small budget and some quite interesting performances as well. My number 16 is gonna be a weird one, it's called Inside and it's a movie starring Willem Dafoe where he's basically stuck in a room for the entire movie. Cat died. Music fades. But art is for keeps. Of course, this reminds us of all the pandemic movies that came out, well, a couple of years ago. Most of them incredibly bad. Some of them quite good. Maybe Bob Burnham's Inside is the only one that really stuck to our minds. And this is another one, even though it's not related to the pandemic at all. It's a movie that is probably not for everyone, mostly because it's very art house, it's very indie, and it's very performance-based because there is not that much going on. But I love how it's all about deconstruction 
destruction, destruction, and what you can actually create from that from an artistic perspective. So if you are an artist, you're definitely gonna love this movie because there is so much to talk about. And just in case you wanted to know, it's directed by Vasilis Katsupis. I've never seen any of his films, but I'm definitely gonna keep an eye on him for the future. My number 15 is not gonna be a surprise to anyone because it's David Fincher's The Killer. I was expecting this movie for a really, really long time. And, and to be honest, David Fincher has not been on the top 20 list of mine in a really, really long time. But The Killer kind of represents everything within the filmography of this man that you could possibly imagine. The main character is kind of like put himself in a box where he seems to think that he has control over everything, but at the same time, he really doesn't. So it's kind of funny how this movie is ritual actively kind of talking about the career of David Fincher because he's well known for being incredibly annoying on film sets mostly because he wants everything to be perfect he for example asks cinematographers and his camera crew to make so many takes one after the other one after the other to the point that even the actors they don't know what they're doing anymore and if they're doing it right just because he's always seeking for some kind of perfection which is almost impossible to find within the art industry industry. Of course it's a movie that is not perfect but just as a almost postmodern analysis of David Fincher's career and his work as a filmmaker. It works so well. Michael Fassbender is also incredible in the role. It's impossible not to put it in the top 20 list in my opinion. Even though maybe the screenplay is not the most interesting part of this movie, there is so much more that you can find there. My number 14 is gonna be quite a different tone because I'm talking about Barbie Greta Garwig's new movie which I watched two times just because it was so incredibly fun and colorful. No, I won't let you do just one appendectomy. But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Can I talk to a doctor? You are talking to a doctor. Can I need a clicky pen? No. A sharp thing? No. There he is. Doctor! Somebody get security. I have a deconstruction of that film in another video just because there is so many things that you can say about it. I'm honestly not gonna linger on it too much just because it's been talked about so much. And even though maybe it's superficial, maybe it's kind of like the most quintessential toy commercial an indie director could ever make. It's so incredibly well made. If you look at the production design, if you look at the performances, the songs, everything about it is so catchy. So even if you hated it because you consider it as the best ad ever made, it's still the best ad ever made and I just loved it unconditionally. They're not gonna stop. No, they're never gonna stop. <laughs> My number 13 is gonna be yet another horror movie and it's gonna be Talk To Me, which was directed by the Raka Raka YouTubers, whose names are Michael and Danny Filippo. Honestly, I have heard so many incredible things about this movie, but I was not expecting myself to enjoy it that much. Honestly, as a horror fan, it's quite hard to be surprised by horror films, and this is one horror film that really surprised me. It's not really relying on jump scares that much, but it's still incredibly terrifying, and it's so related to well Gen Z or also to just the moment that we're living in right now where young people are just looking for any reason whatsoever to escape kind of like everything whether it is capitalism whether it is their own self or whether it is their families or the friends that they don't like the work life and if you'd like to know what this is about it's about a group of friends who discovers how to conjure spirits We're using an embalmed hand they become hooked on the new thrill until one of them goes to far and unleashes terrifying supernatural forces. Now let's swing in the complete opposite direction into a comedy that I loved so 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 much which is called Bottoms which is gonna be my number 12. Welcome to our fucking fight club. Let's get it popping in this motherfucker. <laughs> I want that 
Retro Fluffy. It's in the same veins of other things like Booksmart or even Superbad. This is one of those raunchy comedies, but it's so incredibly well written. And also, this is for the gays. So I'm pretty sure that if you are part of the, that community, you're gonna love this movie quite a lot. Is there anything else that I could say? Honestly, if you like Mean Girls, you're gonna like this movie as well. And honestly, I don't wanna spoil it. I don't wanna spoil any of the jokes. I don't wanna spoil what the movie is actually about. But it's related to Fight Club it's related to kind of like fighting the patriarchy but also how some people use that to get with girls or to get with boys or just as a pathway to be accepted in today's world. It's kind of interesting how they always manage to talk about some big messages by making some of the stupidest jokes ever and this is that kind of movie. <laughs> My number 11 is gonna be yet another horror film and I kind of like that we sandwiched a comedy movie in between two horror films because those are completely opposite things and I'm talking about Elia Bra Thanksgiving. This is a movie that honestly surprised me so much. I didn't see any of the trailers or the promotional material and I know that at this point there is a lot of horror fans who are actually boycotting Elia Roth but I still had to talk about this movie just because it's honestly one of the best slashers and one of the most surprising slashers and one one of the most original slashers and one of the best movies of his career that I've ever seen. This is up there with Happy Death Day when it comes to trying to modernize, trying to kind of like use what we know about the genre, not just giving us new exciting kills, but kind of like creating something that feels completely and utterly new. And once again, we are talking about consumerism and it's kind of funny how the villain of this movie is kind of fighting against consumerism consumerism and there is definitely a reading of this movie where we would be siding with the villain instead of with everyone else just because the way that we live lives nowadays is just so incredibly capitalistic and honestly quite insulting and basically after a black friday riot ends in tragedy a mysterious thanksgiving inspired killer terrorizes plymouth massachusetts the birthplace of the holiday picking residents off one by one what begins as random revenge killings are soon revealed to be part of a large sinister holiday plan and to be honest this is my scream for this year we can delete scream 6 from existence and we can put this at its place because it's so much more fun so much more creative and maybe doesn't have the expectations of a scream movie of course but honestly i will rewatch it every single year because it's that good and now we're finally heading into my top 10 which are gonna be the best 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 top movies of the year Drum roll! Are you excited? I am as well. So my number 10 is gonna be Nimona, which is an animated movie that not that many people have talked about and it came out on Netflix. Let's break stuff. Promise I'm your official sidekick forever and ever. No take backsies. Can you just be you? I don't follow. It was killed by Disney, if I'm not mistaken, and then it was picked up by other creators and Netflix was involved with that as well. It's a movie that has been in the works for such a long time. I have a video for it as well, going deep into the production secrets and analyzing everything about it. What I loved most is that, of course, the main character is so of today when it comes to her fears when it comes to her powers as well the fact that she doesn't want to be defined by anyone else but herself and it's so incredibly colorful this is up there with movies like into the spider-verse or even the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem movie which came out this summer. It's really trying to do something new when it comes to its visual style. Honestly, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It's super short and it will definitely make you sad as well because it's a really cool story. Let's stay into the animation realm and, and talk about my number nine, which is gonna be Makoto Shinkai's Suzume, which I got to see on its national premiere here in France. And it was honestly so, 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 so much fun I love this movie almost as much as your name which is saying quite a lot yeah. 
君この辺りに扉はない I have a review for this movie as well, and I put it into one of my least watched videos ever, a retrospective on Makoto Shinkai's career. So go check that out if you'd like to see more, especially when it comes to trying to contextualize everything with this director and what it means for him to make a movie like Suzume. I also have some backstage details that I talked about in that video. I'm not gonna say anything more just because it makes me sad that that video didn't work out that much. So if you want to know more about it just click there los tiempos de la fe se terminan rápido I feel like this is an emotional roller coaster, right? Because my number eight is gonna be yet another horror film, and it's called When Evil Lurks, which is an Argentinian horror movie, and it's one of the most brutal horror movies I've seen in a really long time. If you like movies like Terrifier, but you wanted the violence to be taken even more seriously, then don't look further away than When Evil Lurks, because this movie is absolutely disgusting in the best ways possible. It's directed by Damien Rutnia, and it's basically about the residents of a small rural town who discover that a demon is about to be born among them, and they desperately try to escape before this evil is born, but it may be too late. Honestly, there are not that many original horror movies about possession and this, without a doubt, is one of them. So jump on it, especially if you're a horror fan. My number seven is gonna be Skinnamarink, which is a movie that I actually watched quite a lot of time after the hype went down because a lot of horror fans loved this movie and I'm pretty sure that if you're not a horror fan, you will find this movie a little bit boring because this is kind of like a heart house horror movie. In this house. It requires a lot of patience. I feel like this is at the same level as the first Paranormal Activity or movies like Blair Witch Project as well, where it required so much of your attention and you have to like take it really, really seriously in order to believe in it and in order to enjoy it as well. Because most of it, you don't really understand what is going on. You have to look through the darkness. You have to try to hear everything that is being said and everything that is not being said. You have to interpret so many things this is a movie that you cannot watch while being on your phone and you need a big screen as well to be able to really immerse yourself but it's absolutely terrifying but it's one of those experiences that you probably can have only once in your lifetime because I remember every single time that I go back to movies like Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity I kind of get bored and I almost want to fast track to the most scary moments and this is probably gonna be the same with Skin and Ring this is one of those movies that you experience once you kind of like amazed by it just because it's pure experimental horror work in the most low budget possible and it's kind of like everything that a horror movie used to be in the 80s in the 70s in the 60s as well where it was just pure passion a really strong concept and not that much else at the end of the day you have to let your imagination do most of the work and of course it's quite tiring but it completely pays off this movie is honestly one of the most incredible movies I saw this year and probably ever. And I forgot to say that it's directed by Kyle Edward Bull and it's basically about these two children who wake up in the middle of the night to find their father missing and all the windows and the doors in their home have vanished. My number six is gonna be Animal Kingdom aka Le Règne Animal. It's a French movie and it's directed by Thomas Caillé. I've talked about this movie in a previous video as well and honestly if you like the X-Men, if you like New Mutants, this is gonna be your 
movie. It's incredible, honestly, that we managed to make movies like this here in France. And these are the type of movies also that people love, but they never go to the cinema and support them here. Like the French industry makes no sense sometimes because people are going insane saying that French cinema is not original. There is no space for genre filmmaking. So basically science fiction, fantasy and horror here in France. But as soon as there is something original that comes out, nobody goes out and supports it. Makes no sense. But I'm gonna redirect you to that video up there just because it's a better deconstruction. But I'm still gonna tell you what it is about just in case you're too tired to click on something here on the screen. In a world hit by a wave of mutations transforming humans into animals, Francois does everything he can to save his wife. As some of the creatures disappear into a nearby forest, he and their son Emile embark on a quest that will change their lives forever. Let's get into the top five and this is gonna be incredibly subjective because it's definitely not one of the best films of the year but personally speaking it was one of the best emotional journeys that I've seen ever and I'm talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. This movie, honestly, I would like to watch it almost every single day because it's the perfect end of a journey for all of these characters. It's so much fun and it's also so incredibly sad. It has so many powerful moments. It has a very, very compelling villain and honestly I talked about it in another video I know that like this video is now becoming almost like a weird ad of me pointing you in other directions instead of asking you to stay here this is where I lose my objectivity completely just because usually I don't put superhero movies in my lists because I want actually to be able to suggest things that you might not have heard of before and this is not the case with these kind of blockbuster movies right but Guardians of the Galaxy honestly it it really stuck with me the emotional journeys of all these characters but the script itself the special effects which for once they actually look so incredibly weird and fun and the soundtrack I keep listening to it almost every single day and that is saying something this is one special movie and James Gunn is an incredible director have you been dreaming about me have I been dreaming about you yeah my number four is gonna be Dream Scenario starring Nicolas Cage. This is a movie that I watched quite recently and maybe there is some recency bias but honestly when I stopped I was sitting there being like I've never seen anything like this. Nicolas Cage makes so many incredible weird choices when it comes to his career and this is definitely one of them. It's directed by Christopher Borgley and it's basically about hapless family man Paul Matthews who finds his life turned upside down when millions of strangers suddenly start seeing him in their dreams. But when his nighttime appearances take a nightmarish turn, Paul is forced to navigate this newfound stardom. So kind of like the movie Landscape with Invisible Hands, this is yet another movie about influencers and about the public eye and being forced into the public realm without your consent and this is something that happens quite often when you think about it when you're making content online sometimes you're making it just because you're having fun and then for some reason or whatever you're becoming famous and influential even though you just wanted to have fun with your friends making f weird videos i accidentally became a meme i accidentally became a meme i accidentally became a meme my name is Lena morris but you may know me as overly attached girlfriend and this is exactly what this movie is about and it takes some incredibly weird and cringy and sometimes even terrifying turns. It reminds me of things like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, especially when it comes to philosophizing about dreams, reality, what it all means, and also how scary it would be if someone could enter your dreams and you couldn't do absolutely anything about it. This is kind of a weird science fiction film when you think about it, or even a horror film, but it's scary at a different level. And honestly, I really recommend it. Let's head into our top three now and talk about Le Livre des Solutions, aka The Book of Solutions, directed by Michel Gondry. Il fait un documentaire sur une fourmi. Ça fait deux jours qu'il fait que ça. 
and uh, I have a video for this movie as well. Uh, this is a great year for French filmmaking and European filmmaking just in general. I love Michel Gondry's work. If you like things like Be Kind, Rewind, uh, you're gonna love this movie without a doubt because long story short, this is about the love of filmmaking, but it's also about what filmmaking can do to you as a person, how it can change your personality, how it can change relationships with the people around you, your friends, your co-workers. And it's also about how certain people especially men filmmakers they're allowed to do so much more and so many more crazy weird things that women are not really allowed to do within the industry and I really really love that we don't really talk about it in film form that much but we talk about it a lot on Twitter and in other types of debates online this place you know it's not for you I don't think I'll ever go home again My number two is gonna be Saltburn and it's directed by Emerald Fennel. This movie was next level fucked up. It's definitely one of the best looking movies I've seen in a really, 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 really long time. Incredible performances by Barry Keegan and Jacob Elordi. Honestly, there is nothing that I love more than incredibly weird movies. They kind of talk about sexuality and even more when it's about male sexuality because we don't really talk about it that much. And if you think about it, if this movie was kind of gender swapped it would have been so incredibly forgettable kind of like a basic instinct type of movie but let me tell you what it is about so that you know exactly what I'm saying and it's basically about a student called Oliver Quick who is struggling to find his place at Oxford University and he finds himself drawn into the world of the charming and aristocratic Felix Cutton who invites him to Saltburn his eccentric family sprawling estate for a summer never to be forgotten and it's all about falling in love but also in hate with with certain people. It's one of those eat the rich movies by the way so if you love them this is one of those and it's one of the best ones of this year without a doubt. Honestly I usually don't like movies that are just about the aristocracy and about the rich and asking us to kind of like care about them but this is not about that at all because we are sitting on the perspective of the other guy. This kind of reminds me of Yorgos Lanthimos the favorite so if you like the favorite and the idea idea of the little guy trying to influence and infiltrate aristocratic families, you're gonna love this movie without a doubt. And now let's add into the best movie of this year, which is sitting right behind me, of course. Miles, being Spider-Man is a sacrifice. You have a choice between saving one person and saving every world. Honestly, since it was released, it's been at the top. And I know that a lot of people have criticized this movie mostly because of, of its ending and people not knowing that this, this was supposed to be just part one of a two-part journey. And the fact that its final act doesn't really resolve anything for this movie from a screenwriting perspective because this channel is all about tearing movies apart and specifically about tearing screenplays apart because that's the thing that I'm really interested in. But I'm sitting here being like, this movie has so so many incredible things about it that I almost can disregard the fact that it doesn't really have an ending. Kind of like what happened with Dune Part 1 two years ago where I put it in my top 20 list of that year and I still told you that it's kind of hard to rank this movie, it's kind of hard to rate this movie because it's literally half of an emotional journey and this is not like Lord of the Rings, this is not like even Infinity War and Endgame, this is 100% a journey that was cut in half and a lot of people hated that but it's so incredibly beautiful. It's honestly better than Into the Spider-Verse for one specific reason and it is the fact that I finally understand what it means to be Spider-Man thanks to this movie here and thanks to Miles Morales as well who is an incredibly interesting character that gives so much new energy to Spider-Man as an IP as well. Among all of the weirdest Spider-Man ever that you've seen in this film, I feel like Miles Morales is 
still the most interesting one. It's the one that I want to look at for the future as well. It's kind of interesting because right now I'm playing Spider-Man 2 as well. I'm a bit late to the hype, of course, but it's interesting how within the game as well is not the best Spider-Man because the Spider-Man game is 100% about Peter Parker's Spider-Man. He's got the most interesting stuff going on when it comes to his emotional journey. But Miles Morales, when you go into side quest content and stuff like that, is 100% the most interesting part of that game. And I feel like it's the same thing when it comes to this movie here as well, which gives us the best Spider-Man I've ever seen. I feel like this movie is really showcasing how Peter Parker's journey is kind of like on repeat mode. We keep repeating the same mistakes, the same cliches, the same storylines. And they're trying to convince us that this is what it means to be Spider-Man that the loss that they go through, the, the people that they have to sacrifice and leave behind, this is what makes Spider-Man. Miles Morales proves them that it's not true and I'm pretty sure that in the next movie is gonna prove it even more and this is why I'm like this movie is so good just because it redefined the Spider-Man within an industry, within a world, within a universe where there are so many spider movies, there are so many Spider-Man comics, there are so many different types of Spider-Man fans that it's almost impossible to do it. So I was sitting there being like, how is it possible that you manage to make a movie like this? And the Spider-Gwen story within this movie is incredible as well. Visually speaking, I think it's even better than Into the Spider-Verse because it just goes further. While Into the Spider-Verse was the appetizer, this is 100% the main course. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. What are you doing? Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. But anyways, I'm gonna put here all of my favorite movies from this year so you can screenshot that and put them into your watch list if you'd like that. I hope you enjoyed this video. Of course, this is all about sharing her love of filmmaking. So let me know down in the comments what your lists are. What are your favorite movies of this year? And also, if you like this video, I'm gonna link you to some other stuff that I've done on this channel. First of all, the best movies list of last year, the Oscars video that I mentioned, but also one video that you might like, the worst movies of this year, which I worked on a couple of weeks ago, and it was incredibly fun, to be honest, but not that many people watched it, and it's a bit of a shame. As usual, I'm gonna put here at the top the topic of next video, and I hope to see you there in two weeks otherwise you can still watch Torn Apart News which is happening every single Monday on this YouTube channel. Don't forget to smash that like button every single time that you do that you ensure that Miles Morales is bitten by the spider and becomes Spider-Man. Can I count on you? And of course by that you're confirming that he's a Spider-Man as well he's not a mistake so give some likes to Miles Morales Spider-Man man so that he knows that you love him as much as you love every single other spider-man in the multiverse i'm patrick and this is torn apart Ta-da-da-da-da, ta da 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 da